Good morning. Before we begin with the lesson, I wanted to let you know that there are some uh, folders in the back. I don't know uh, for picking them up how that works with our exit procedures, but uh, in a week and a half on Wednesday, we plan to, Lord willing, start a new study uh, on the New Testament church. Uh, and so there are folders uh, with Roy Cogdell's information, uh, material uh, that's been provided. So uh, if you have access to that, watch for those on your way out in the foyer. That is if you plan to participate in the adult class on Wednesday night uh, here in the auditorium. So I want to introduce the message with a little short story about something that happened about 105 years ago uh, on the baseball field. 1915, uh, there was a uh, third base coach named Miller Huggins. Uh, he was a manager, manager and third base coach, uh, and it was the seventh inning. The Cardinals uh, were playing, and they were playing Brooklyn. And uh, so anyway, there's a pitcher named uh, Appleton. Uh, Brook, uh, the Ed Appleton was on the mound, and they were, they were just, they were just uh, tied up at the time with two outs, and this this third base coach, coach, Miller Huggins, calls over to the pitcher, Appleton, before he's about to, uh, to, to throw his pitch. And uh, he, says, uh, he, he says to him, uh, hey, hey, bub, let me see that ball. And, you know, he, he's just a rookie, this Appleton fella, and uh, isn't really thinking about the fact that Time has not been called, and uh, the game is still very active. And so, because this uh, older gentleman, uh, so I guess respectfully or authoritatively, called for the ball to be thrown to him so that he could see it for whatever reason, uh, you can imagine what happened next. The pitcher just throws it over there to the third base coach, and of course, his response was to simply, you know, do this number and let it go right by him. And uh, so they watch the ball go over towards the dugout while the, the man on third base, the winning run, uh, trots on down across home plate. I don't know what public sentiment was uh, the next day about such things. I can imagine if you're for the winning team, then they probably loved it. What I know about the world, I'm sure some people were probably uh, a little taken back by the sneaky, underhanded, uh, unscrupulous, dishonest, mean thing that was done there. But the fact that he took advantage of someone so trusting, so, uh, so inexperienced like that is enough to make us uh, to think uh, is, that's not fair for him to do that. And yet we understand that that's exactly what happens in the spiritual realm all the time. Uh, one, I wanted to share with you some of these scriptures. Oh, sorry, there's a picture of the individuals there. There's uh, Mr. Huggins and Mr. Appleton. You know, no difficulty determining which one is which. So uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get video for you. It's 105 years ago, but I, I searched in vain for something like that. But anyway, here's these New Testament scriptures about the dangers of, uh, of being deceived. Today, it talks about uh, uh, servants of Satan who are false apostles, deceitful workers who transform themselves into apostles of Christ. Uh, it, it, Paul warns in Ephesians 4 that we not be children tossed to and fro, carried away by uh, tri the trickery of men. In Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Let no one cheat you. Let no one deceive you. It says there were false prophets, even as there will be among you in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. And then 1 John 4, 1, test every spirit. Don't believe the spirits. You've got to test them uh, because there are many false prophets in the world. Uh, this is not a, a one and done sort of warning here. It, it's all over the New Testament warning us about the dangers of being tricked. What would you say to Mr. Appleton if you, if you, you know, if, if you had the chance to try to prepare someone like this? Can you understand, can you appreciate how someone in his position, you might say, well, he's in the, he's in the, 
you know, the majors at this point. He should have known better. Uh, imagine the man, his, his own manager, thinking, you know, I, I didn't think I needed to cover situations. Like, I didn't think I needed to talk about this. It, can you prepare for something like that? Uh, can you be ahead? Can you stay ahead of those who transform themselves and are uh, are very experienced and skillful at uh, at being uh, deceptive? So we're in First Kings thirteen because it's a it's a I think it's the best story in the scriptures that illustrate. Uh, these practices at work. And it, we're talking about King Jeroboam, and he, he is the one whose hand was withered when the young prophet uh, called for the altar to be uh, desecrated, just according to the prophet of God hundreds of years before that. And his hand, as it says, was shriveled when he extended it in order to have him arrested. And of course, as it is the case, a lot of times when uh, bad things happen to bad people, they, they, uh, they feign uh, a little bit of faith in God or uh, a little bit of religion in their lives, and they ask that he might pray for him on behalf of his hand. And so uh, Jeroboam's hand is restored after the young prophet prays on his behalf. So one of the things that you point out from verses 8 and 9 is that if this was the end of the story, it would be wonderful because this is the first test that this young prophet receives. Because after his hand was restored, the king, King Jeroboam said, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. It harkens back to the Balaam story, right? Balaam in uh, Numbers 22 where Balak says to Balaam, come with me and, and curse Israel, and I will give you a great reward. And in like manner, this young prophet also says, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way that you came. Okay, so he passed the first test. God was very clear about the expectation not to return by the same way, nor to go into anyone's house. So then there was this plot. Then there was this older prophet, the second test, if you will. He lived in Bethel. His sons came and told him all that this man of God had said and done. And he immediately feels some connection to him. Oh, we're both prophets. I, I want this man to come to my house. And uh, he personally mounts his donkey and goes and requests his company at dinner. And even though the young prophet had faithfully answered King Jeroboam, Mind you, the king who has offered a great reward. For whatever reason, this young man is easily duped into acquiescing to this older prophet's request. Now, if you're wondering why God didn't just use this guy to prophesy against Jeroboam's altar, perhaps that becomes clear in verse 18. Why doesn't God just use this older prophet who is right there? to go and, and do this. And uh, you get a little insight into the character of this man. When he says to this younger prophet, verse 18, I too am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with you, uh, bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. For he was lying to him. And without any further inquiry, without stopping to say, you know, I happen to be a prophet of the Lord myself. Let me see what is the word of the Lord concerning this matter. You know, something like Moses might have done and had done on numerous occasions. Instead, he says, so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. What a terrifying scene it must have been at dinner that night when all of a sudden 
the mood changes from jovial and uh, hospitable and comfortable to the oracle of the word of God, perhaps at one point now again uh, gracing the lips of this older man, this older prophet. And notice what it says there in verse 20. It happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you. But you came back and ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Let's look at some, uh, some lessons from this story. First of all, the deception can come from the most unlikely sources. That just as 2 Peter 2 verse 1 talked about, false teachers would come from even among you. Now, one of the reasons I'm doing this lesson, one, is because uh, we're going to be, uh, some of us this week, looking at uh, the way that Satan works. And it got my mind to thinking about the, the deception and how he, how he deceives. But also, if you'll remember back about four months ago, we started on this path. When I, want, I told you I wanted to talk about the way of Cain, the gainsaying of Korah, uh, and the greed of Balaam. Those three false prophets that are used as figureheads to what Second Peter and Jude refer to as the false teacher. So this is a, this is a reminder. We're going to get that uh, series uh, going again. This is similar to what we talked about about four months ago when you may remember the illustration of my kids and how, uh, how freely, how, how comfortably they run up to, when they were younger, uh, someone in a, a costume, a suit at the mall. You know, you got your big uh, Easter bunny, for example, and they're hugging all these kids when who knows, who knows what is under there. Here's another illustration of that. Uh, Matthew 7 15 says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves so you got a picture of Charles Darwin and the actual Santa next to him or one that could easily pass for a uh, mall Santa uh, how do you tell the difference there you put a, a fake beard and a Santa hat on Charles Darwin and you've got Santa Claus Trusting, right? Are you gonna you gonna trust Charles Darwin with your kids? You know, he might kill them if he thinks they're gaining an advantage or something by it. I mean, it's just natural, right? Natural. Uh, I'm exaggerating just a little bit. Uh, so, just to make it a point, the deception comes from the most unlikely of sources. You would not have anticipated that a man who served as a prophet, who came out specifically to spend time with you. Would, would be someone that would so lie to you. Secondly, deceivers, in some cases, some are deceived themselves and also deceive others, but in some cases also, they couldn't care less for their victims, especially those who are motivated by, uh, by greed and for personal gain. There are some who, the scriptures say, turn the grace of God into licentiousness. And we've got to be on guard against false doctrine on the basis that we will like what they are saying, that we will be drawn to the appeal of religion and spirituality uh, in, in spite of the fact that it's not all true what they're saying. And so uh, some, some have no regard. And I think of this older prophet. There's no seemingly no concern on his part. We at least don't read about it. I know the dinner conversation must have been really awkward after that, right? Can you imagine, uh, by the way, your corpse is not going to return. Uh, you're going to die on the way home. Uh, what do you talk about after that? Well, thanks for dinner. You appreciate the hospitality. Uh, how, do you, how do you end that conversation? Uh, you know, you would think that, I mean, I wish that we could get to see what the older prophet had said. 
at this point. We don't get to see that. Instead, what we get to see is uh, applications uh, from, from Scripture. For example, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 15 shows that their end will be according to their works. Okay? We don't get to see how they felt about it, like in this case. But Paul says that those who transform themselves into angels of light and false apostles, their end will be according to their works. So, I mean, as much as we, uh, as clearly as we can see what happened to the younger prophet and what, ha what, what, what his uh, result was, uh, by faith we look at what uh, the apostles have taught. It says in Ephesians 5, 6 that the wrath of God comes upon them. And 2 Peter 2, 1, they'll bring upon themselves swift destruction. Another thing that I'm a little confused about here is that after you hear from this older prophet that, uh, uh, you know, your corpse shall not come to the, to the tomb of your fathers. Why, why no prostration of yourself? If you're the younger prophet, are you leaving that house before you have thrown yourself on the ground and wept for your sin and begged God for forgiveness? Where is the attitude that David had in 2 Samuel 12, 22? Who knows? Who knows if maybe perchance God will hear my prayer and will be merciful and, and spare the child. So nothing of the sort. He just kind of, okay, well, I guess I'll be off then. <laughs> kind of recommend that you not do that. That's just an aside, free of charge for you. So the text says that the old prophet mounted his donkey for him. <laughs> this guy can't, uh, just can't get any nicer. Uh, at least he could do after, after what he had done. Uh, 24 through 31. Let's look at what happened to this man. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. And there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. So this young prophet became a sign. He became a sign to the city and to all in it because there were witnesses to the fact that this lion had killed him but had not touched the donkey. But that the lion was simply sitting there by his kill. This was not a natural attack. This lion was uh, prepared by the Lord and he was doing his will. Uh, so this was God putting an exclamation point on his previous prophecy which the young prophet had served well in articulating at the beginning of chapter 13. And I want to I wanna get you to think about in terms of, of this, that if this is the end of the prophet of God, according to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, then what will be the case for those who do not know God? You'd think that this would be a wake-up call, that if this is how the young prophet met his end because he, re he violated the, uh, the order not to go and eat bread or drink water in this place, then what will be the case for those who do not know God? That's taken from 1 Peter 4, verse 17. There it says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Thirdly, only a little error is enough, or maybe enough, to kill us. And, you know, I don't have any idea what the big deal is about stopping for a meal. What was God trying to accomplish by that? Why re refuse that? Uh, I mean, he had served these people by prophesying against them, right? It's always a, a service to bring the word of the Lord to the area. And, you know, you don't muzzle the ox. I mean, it, it's only right, of course, right, that uh, he, he had administered to them spiritual things. And now, I mean, isn't it natural and right? Kind of like letting the ox, uh, not muzzling the ox while he threshes the grain. 
to uh, allow him to uh, to eat of uh, of their ge ge generosity and, and thankfulness in bringing the prophecy of God. I mean, you can make the argument that it's it's natural and, and usually a good thing to be supported by people who want to support uh, those who have preached the word of God. I can't explain why verse 8 um, or verse 9 is there. However, that's not the only case of which you might say, well, I, I can't imagine that that's a death penalty offense. You know, in the New Testament, among the list of, uh, of, of heresies that can condemn one's soul are subjects such as requiring circumcision. You, I mean, that would be another thing where, you know, is, is it really that big of a deal? Really wish it wasn't happening, but, uh, I mean, it's not like it's going to change how we, how we treat one another. It's not like the greatest, second greatest command about love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it's, it's really just kind of a, a ritualistic thing. Can that really condemn a person's soul? Paul said that it could. Being confused about the day of the Lord, whether or not it has already come or not. Some taught that it had already come in the days of Paul, and he says that, that it was gangrene, and that Hymenaeus and Philetus were preaching this that was upsetting people's souls and having eternal consequences. Forbidding foods and forbidding marriage and things like that. He talks about those things that we might say, you know, they don't rise to the level of, uh, you know, what some might say a salvation issue. But that's not the way the New Testament talks about these things. A little error may be enough to kill. And so we need to be very careful about doctrine and always keep a focus on what the scriptures teach. Deception also comes uh, with God's permission. First Kings chapter 13 verse 9 makes me, uh, again, uh, look at this question more carefully. Verse 9, where we recall that the Lord commanded specifically, you shall not eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the same way that you came. Okay, look at verse 12 though. So, the old pro verse 11, the old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the words that the man of God had done. They in Bethel they told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Now, there is no rest of the story if that little, that little detail didn't happen. Why did God let that happen? God let his sons see which way the man of God went. That's what enabled the rest of the story to take place. Why didn't God just like turn their faces the other way as he passed? Why didn't he occupy them with something? And this could have gone, uh, gone on just fine. Everything would have been okay. He would have gone to his home. Uh, he'd already passed the first major test with King Jeroboam, why did God allow that to happen? We know, we know that 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11 tells us that God will not stand in the way of deception. He'll not stand in the way of men like uh, Mr. Huggins who said, hey, hey, bub, let me see that ball. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God sent strong delusion. God allowed that to happen. One of the, I'm not going to take the time to look at it. One of the best uh, uh, illustrations of that is in 1 Kings 22. Verses 20 through 22, uh, where you got the you got Ahab and the prophet Micaiah, and uh, uh, you know basically you got one of the uh, angels saying, "Well, I'll go and be a lying spirit uh, in the mouth of the prophets," and so this lying spirit becomes the means by which uh, Ahab 
refuses to believe the prophet of the Lord and instead believes these fake phony prophets who are being very uh, charismatic about their false prophecies and convincing the king. So God allowed that to happen. And so that's our wake up call. That's us trying to get a hold of the Appletons of the world before the, 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 the deception comes. Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, this young man and how perhaps a case can be made that he was uh, flirting with disaster in some, in some measure. It's just one thing you want to ask the man. Dear sir, just what do you suppose was inferred by 13 verse 9? Okay. Remember that the, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. What is, what is written between the lines there? Get out of that place. You've got about a five to six mile journey. Don't linger. Don't, don't give time for this. What are we, are you on a rest stop here? Are you breaking? No. What do you suppose God meant to convey by don't eat bread, don't drink water, don't return by the same place. You need to hightail it out of this place. There's nothing good around here, only danger. So let's think about that when it comes to snuggling up the line. When God commands something to be done, let's not flirt with disaster by trying to see how closely we can get with crossing it. Let's not justify one thing by saying, well, technically I'm not, you know, hear yourself talking about technically this or that is not. Uh, you should understand uh, that you are like, uh, you're, you're, on a, you're in a rest area in, uh, behind enemy lines here, just like this young prophet in dangerous territory. We also, of course, need to test, as this young prophet should have done, test doctrine by the word of God. Acts 1711, the Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness. Uh, exa and examine the scriptures to see whether or not these things were so. First John 4, 1 commands that we test every spirit because there's many false uh, prophets that have gone out into the world. And verse 6 says, We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so there's a very objective way an objective standard of, of determining this. It's not about how you feel about a man and whether or not you get a good feeling from, from your time with them or, or how, how many good works they're involved in. You know, I was really impressed by this older prophet and he just really, uh, you know, you could tell he would really lived a lot, lifelong service for God. None of that mattered. It was all objective according to 1 John 4. If he hears us, then he is from God. If he doesn't, then he is not. So we want to just conclude by uh, noting that uh, we should be on guard against new revelation. Just like this young prophet received some new revelation. He had gotten old revelation already. The, the initial uh, command was that he not eat bread nor drink water nor return by the same way you came. But here comes this new revelation. Look again at verse 18. I too am a prophet and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying. Well, that's new. As we said before, he didn't care to vet that, to check it out, to see if that was really the case. First time I was introduced to this story, I thought, well, this is just totally unfair. It's a catch-22. What if the new revelation had come about, and now he's, he didn't go, and he's found uh, in contradiction to God's law? Uh, you know, it's like he uh, is in trouble either way or something. And we, we, know, we know better. That God doesn't work this way. He's not the author of confusion. He doesn't tell us one thing and then have someone else come and tell us the exact opposite. Um, so that's not the way it works. And Paul says in Galatians 1.6, he warns that even if an angel from heaven should come and preach a new doctrine, 
And this is in keeping with and in likeness to what Moses taught concerning false prophets. He said, even if a prophet arises among you and works a sign in your midst and then says we should go serve other gods. Well, we say, well, he did a sign. <laughs> well, what does that mean? He says, even then you shall not hear him. You shall not listen to him. He's a false prophet. I don't care what he did. And that's God covering bases for even, even when someone has a false sign that looks pretty convincing. Even when someone seems to be able to have some great power of God, like Simon in Acts 8. He, everyone said he was the great power of God. Well, if he's not teaching truth, you still need to establish the doctrine based upon the revelation of God. So deceiver is still very much on the prowl. Some of the common lines that he uses today. What makes, what makes us think that we are right? You know, how, how can we be so, how can we be so uh, arrogant as to think that, that we're, we're right? You know, it's like everybody has a little bit of truth. That's, the, that's what's kind of behind that thinking. Uh, and so that allows us to be thinking compromise when we start thinking, well, who are we to say that we're right? That's not to say that we don't have open minds about what is taught and that we don't pursue everything according to God's word and what is taught. Uh, could God really be that strict is another one of the things that people will ask about. And they turn issues like, uh, well, things that come up into whether or not they are salvation issues or something that could condemn a person to hell. And we immediately begin to talk about, well, is this really something that would condemn a person to hell? I hope that, I hope that this lion attack over whether or not the man ate or did not eat is enough to get us to not speak in terms of, well, is this really a salvation issue that we need to care uh, about here? Let, let's be careful about making everything into, well, is this going to condemn a soul to hell or not? That's dangerous talking. We just need to try to pursue the best truth we can under every circumstance. Uh, and then finally, another one is, uh, well, they, and I hear this a lot from people. You try to point out that, um, you, you know, what they're teaching over here, you guys, you're, you're attending this, uh, this uh, church over here, but they're teaching this, this, and this. I often hear, but these are wonderful people. You wouldn't believe how spiritual you wouldn't believe how uh, what kind of changes has ta had taken place in their lives. Uh, uh, you know how receptive they've been to me. How what a family. You know we start talking about all these subjective measures, uh, uh, gauges, instead of really what is the truth about what is being taught. We're thankful for people who are who are kind and gracious and have a measure of of the of the spirit as far as. Uh, how you're supposed to treat people, but if this story teaches us anything, it's that God doesn't compromise what he's commanded for us to do. So, we, we full circle now. Um, we're back to, the, we're back to the, the, the picture. We're back to the mound. And we're back to that older gentleman saying, hey, bub, show me that ball. Let me see that ball. It might be convincing. It might be authoritative. With all due respect, you might want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But what's at stake here is just too great for us to be naive. We don't want to be like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So hopefully this will be like part two of the introduction to the series on what does the false teacher look like. We'll start with the way of Cain, then the, the gainsaying of, of Korah, and finish up with, uh, with Balaam's example. So appreciate your attention this morning. We do have guests among us this morning. We're really glad that you joined us as well. Uh, but if there happens to be someone in the audience that needs to respond to the Lord's invitation, we always end our service, our preaching uh, uh, segment with an opportunity to respond to we're going to sing a song of encouragement and if you're in a position where you need to uh, confess your faith in the Lord and turn from your sins and and be immersed with him in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sins uh, we're very 
very happy to be able to provide that opportunity and have the baptistry to do that. Uh, or if you've already done that and you'd like to ask for encouragement from your brethren for some sin that you've committed, we, we stand ready to help you. Whatever your need is, come forward now while we stand and sing. Jesus, the Lord.